my interest for the last five years has been on how technology can support uh, human flourishing. Really how uh, technology can be a catalyst for deep and profound well-being. And this really came from um, my path as an engineer um, and spending all of my time solving these problems on the outside, these engineering challenges, trying to sort of optimize my, my external world in a way, and realizing in a certain point that I had left out half of the equation, that I had missed my entire inner world. And as I started to explore meditation, what I realized was that this inner exploration actually was profoundly important, even vital, to my well-being, to the way that I existed in the world. And at that point, I understood that um, the only technology that I wanted to design, the only engineering that I wanted to do, was technology and engineering that had to do with that aspect of our human experience. Because for me, nothing else was more important. And so um, some of the things I've been into, along with Jeffrey over here, I co-founded something called the Transformative Technology Conference, um, which is now in its second year. And sort of like this is the nexus point in Silicon Valley for the entrepreneurs, the venture capitalists, the engineers that are exploring this space. Um, I started a global community called Consciousness Hacking, which um, started off as a few folks sitting around in a circle in San Francisco, soon turned into 100 folks at a time gathering, and now we have over 20 communities around the world, which is really this grassroots, grassroots representation of the fact that um, there's a deep interest here. There's an excitement. There's a hunger for exploring this space. And um, I also, this is just started a few months ago, started teaching this very topic at Stanford. Um, and after having applied to graduate school, I think three different occasions, trying to make the case for what I was calling contemplative engineering or transformative technology, and nobody having any idea what I was talking about, um, it's very gratifying now to be able to be teaching at one of the best institu institutions in the world and begin to be actually exploring and spreading these ideas. Um, and so um, I want to first, there's sort of two parts to this talk. One is an exploration of why I think that what we're doing here is incredibly important. And by that I mean um, this whole exploration of modern, innovative approaches to well-being, to flourishing, to health. And then the, uh, the last part of the talk is exploring um, what I see as some of the main challenges. So first, starting at like the most obvious level, the thing that you all know, it's probably the reason why we're in this room, is that there is incredible demand. There is a huge industry emerging which wants deeply and will pay huge amounts of money for interventions that can help us to feel better. And the numbers are, are really staggering, right? And, and this is um, an upward trend. So um, a, a, for millennials, they spend roughly a quarter of their disposable income on well-being. But the other part of it is that there's massive need. Right? And you all know these stats. I'm just taking just the stats on stress. Right, 20% of Americans report extreme stress. 69% report physical symptoms of stress. Two-thirds of doctor visits are stress-related ailments. And job stress costs $300 billion annually. So um, this is not just that there's a massive industry waiting to be tapped, but that there's a massive need and problems that can be solved. But to take it a little bit deeper, I really believe that this is not just about reducing stress. I actually think that this is the tip of the iceberg. This is the, the external manifestation of it. And that actually, um, there's a, a deeper level. There's a, there's a quote that I love from the United Nations. It says, since wars begin in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that the defenses of peace must be constructed. This is the first sentence of the UNESCO Constitution. And for me, what this is a clear acknowledgement of, a recognition of, is that 
The crises that we see in our world are created by crises within people. The pain and suffering that we see in the world is created by people that are experiencing pain and suffering. The anger in the world comes from angry people, right? And it's possible to change the world from the inside out, and I deeply believe that. And we um, are served by putting out the fires as they come up. It's not that we should stop doing that. But if we could take a two-pronged approach, and if we could deeply and dramatically change the human experience, then how would our world change? And um, to take it even further, um, I actually think that this is at the point of even not being optional. That this is something that we need to quickly wake up to and recognize. Um, it's what I call the transformative technology imperative. And it's the recognition first and foremost that, as we all know, technology is exponentially ubiquitous, right? The next generation um, will be born into a world where likely almost every aspect of their experience will be in some way or another mediated by technology. And the other part of it is that technology in a deep way is shaping our reality. What do I mean by that? Um, if you look at essentially every meditation technique that exists, in one way or another, it's a tool to help you learn how to um, shape or optimize or transform your attention. And if you look at almost any kind of interactive technology that exists, especially media, it's also some type of tool designed to hold and maintain and shape human attention. From television, from radio to television to video games to apps, we actually have an escalating arms race of technology that can do a better and better and better job of holding human attention. And why is this? It's because we are what we attend to. Our attention literally shapes who and what we are, our human experience. And advertisers know this, and gurus know this, right? It's, it's not such a secret. And VR, for example, will be the most powerful technology that has ever existed to influence human attention. And so if technology is going to be everywhere increasingly, and it has this incredible power to influence our attention, then we have an unavoidable question. And that is, how is this technology shaping us? How is this technology going to be influencing our reality? What are we going to become? So, um, there's a lot of answers to this question of what do I see as, as the main obstacles to um, creating technology that can have a deeply transformative and positive influence on human experience. Um, and I'm going to just pick two that I see as salient and most intriguing to me right now. Um, the first one is this idea that Lack of disease does not equal the presence of health. And by that, I don't mean that we should stop trying to cure disease um, or that we shouldn't focus on um, clinical conditions and, and the huge, huge number of people that are suffering in the world. But what I'm pointing out is that we have a healthcare system that is designed simply to cure disease and is largely um, ignoring a huge facet of our human experience. So this is a, a model that I like, and it shows um, on one axis the presence of mental illness, and on the other axis on the right, um, the lack of mental illness. 
which is mostly the continuum that we're focused on, but there's another continuum, which is the continuum of languishing and flourishing. And that um, arguably, um, statistically, most people in the United States are somewhere in this um, no mental illness but languishing category. Yeah, there's nothing clinically diagnosable here, but there's no real deep enjoyment of life. And so um, the huge possibility that I see is for the startups, the entrepreneurs, the VCs, the designers, the makers, the people that are building the technology of the future to actually begin to design for this incredible human potential. Um, I just, um, well, let's see what. So um, I just got back from a, this last weekend from a meditation retreat. Um, and just in two days, it's possible to deepen one's experience beyond anything that we normally have access to in our day-to-day -day life. And there are many individuals in the world who spend 10,000 hours or even 30,000 hours or more of their life engaged in that practice. And why are they doing that? Because they don't want to go out and get a job or something like that? I, I don't think so. Um, they're scientists in a way, deeply exploring the nature of human experience. And what they have discovered is that largely we're only tapping a tiny, tiny, tiny slice of our human potential, of what we can actually be. And uh, academia is beginning to recognize the importance of this. Um, they're taking these individuals who have spent a significant amount of time exploring the nature of human experience, and they're scanning their brains, and they're beginning to build a scientific model and understanding, and this is the bridge. This is the beginning, and the next step is for Silicon Valley and beyond to also realize that we need to begin designing for this human potential. Because the sanity and survival of our species depends on it. Um, and there's another related obstacle. Um, and this has really emerged in, in many ways from my own path, um, which is a recognition that there's a deep relationship between um, who we are and what we build. And I actually saw this in my own experience as a tech designer. This is a project called HeartSync, which is actually on a permanent exhibit at the Tech Museum. You can go play with it. And the way that it works is six people sit around, um, put their hands on sensors that are measuring heart rate variability of the group. And it's actually bringing the group into a state of physiological entrainment. It's basically a group meditation biofeedback device, but it doesn't say meditation or biofeedback anywhere on it. It basically feels like a game. And it's at the Tech Museum, so you mostly have nine-year-olds that are using it, kids that have never meditated before. They sit down, they put their hands on the thing, and they're looking at the screen and they're hearing some sounds, and all of a sudden, um, yeah, they're meditating for the first time, but what I realize is they're also competing against each other. And they're looking at the guy next to them and they're realizing, oh my God, John is so much more relaxed than I am. I'm doing such a crappy job. I've got to breathe harder. And I realized there was a flaw in that technology and the flaw came from me. I was holding a perspective in my own path to well-being that I needed to get there. I was hard on myself. 
I was tracking myself. I was comparing how much more zenned out am I now than I was last week. And when I wasn't zenned out enough, I would get down on myself. It was a very critical process, and that same critical perspective was actually baked right into the technology I created, because that was my perspective on how you find balance and harmony in your life. And so to um, counteract that as a new design iteration, I created this project called Connectome, where there's no points, there's no graphs. There's no charts, there's no winning, there's no losing. It's two people connected to sensors that measures the heart and the breath. And it's an environment designed for human connection where each person can feel the other person's heartbeat vibrating their body through a personal subwoofer. And each person can see and hear the other person's breath as sound and light in the space. And people will show up here that don't know each other and they'll leave best friends. They'll have like the most engaging conversation because you're essentially um, making it easier for people to connect by supporting things such as respiratory synchronization and embodied awareness. So to conclude here, um, I believe that as transformative technologists, right, those of us that are creating these, these technologies that are tapping into the psychological, emotional, physiological dimensions of our experience, we have a unique responsibility that the, the microprocessor designers and shoe designers don't have because we're directly engaging with the subtle aspects of human experience. And that responsibility is actually um, for our own well-being, for our own wisdom, for our own experience, and recognizing that everything we bring into the world is going to be affecting human beings on a deep and profound way, and that the startups are the medicine men of the future. The startups are the spiritual teachers of the future. The startups are the therapists of the future. And so the founders of those startups, the members of those startups, need to take that responsibility seriously. And so I call this the path of the transformative technologist. And, um, and so I leave you with a question to explore what is the relationship between who you are and what you create. Thank you.